Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the April TDL Forum. Um, I'm Laura Waugh, and I'm the marketing coordinator here, and I'm joined today by Christy Park, our executive director, and we also have Courtney Muma, our services manager. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat window and add those questions. And also, as a reminder, we will be recording this forum, and we'll make it available following the presentation today. So just to get started, we have a few, quite a few things to cover today, but we'll first have the updates on the TDL membership changes, and then an update from the TD, the Texas Data Repository Steering Committee a recent meeting and updates on that. Um, we are welcoming a new TDL member uh, to our TDL team, and I'll have a couple of community updates. And for now, I will hand it over to Christy Park. Thanks, Laura. So I'm going to, um, well, first, I'll Welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today. We have a, a, a slim crowd today. I think a lot of folks are headed down to San Antonio for TLA this week. I know I'm, as soon as we wrap things up today, going to get on the road to head down there and um, present later today on our work with, on the digital preservation. I'm sorry, the, the uh, I'm getting my projects confused. The Digital Public Library of America project that we're working on. Um, which I hope we'll have a chance to update this group in this forum about um, soon as well. But today um, I wanted to talk a little bit about changes that we are have been talking about for a while and are planning to begin implementing in the coming fiscal year to TDL's membership categories and the ways that we're setting annual fees for our members. Um, we've been talking primarily with our deans and directors um, about this um, new structure or these changes um, over the course of the last year or more um, and have had multiple discussions. We had a couple of conference calls for our library directors over the last few weeks to discuss them further and hopefully um, they and you have um, already heard or um, or know about a lot of the content that I'm, I'm going to present today, but we wanted to make sure that all of our members um, are on the same page and understanding how things are going to be changing starting next year for, for most of our members. So this is our current membership structure. It um, has been in place for a few years now, um, since around 2011 or so, um, and we basically have two, cat two big categories of members. We have regular members and affiliate members. Uh, regular members are our full members, the members of our consortium who, who participate fully in the life of, of the community. They have governance rights and they have access to all of the technology hosting services that we provide. And under that regular membership, category, we have two tiers, um, the $150,000 a year tier, which is uh, uh, our tier one members, and those are our founding ARL library members. And we have our tier two members who are everybody else um, paying in at a rate of $25,750 a year. In the past, um, we had three tiers of membership. There was a tier in between the 25,000 level and the ARLs um, that paid $50,000 a year, and those institutions were our larger um, research libraries who were not in the founding ARL group. We also had, um, at one time, um, a requirement for committing um, a half or full-time employee to the work of the consortium as part of our membership categories. Um, all of those things um, went away when we changed to this simplified two-tier membership structure. In addition to our regular members, we have affiliate members who um, 
are not full members of the consortium. They get access to one technology hosting service um, and they don't have the rights, um, the governance rights or participation rights in the consortium that our regular members have. We have two, essentially two categories here. One is for, for DSpace Vireo or journal hosting and one for preservation services. Okay, so we've, we've encountered some issues with this simplified structure and um, have been talking about these with our governing board for several years now about how to um, create a, a set of categories that would be um, fairer, more equitable, and um, provide opportunities for growth in the consortium. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of those challenges are that we've identified and that we're trying to address with the changes. So the first problem is that this is kind of a one-size-fits-all model um, that doesn't reflect the value some members get from their membership in, the, in TDL. So for instance, member A here only uses DSpace repository hosting but they're paying the same flat rate as member B who is using all of TDL's services. Second problem we've uh, encountered is that our ARL members have been contributing at, at what we think is an unsustainable rate since 2011. They've always paid in at a higher rate and they will continue to do so, but that, that $150,000 rate um, was never intended to be a permanent situation and um, we have we are in a situation now where those four members are contributing more than half of our current income and that's not sustainable for them or for us we want to create a broader base of funding um, for TDL and distribute the costs of, of operating the consortium more equitably across our membership And the third problem is it's really with that $25,000 level or even the $10,000 level not feasible for smaller institutions to join TDL. And we've encountered this on numerous occasions when we've talked to community colleges, for instance, or small liberal arts institutions. Um, those fees are um, unrealistic for most of them. Um, considering their operations and collections budgets. So then we set out to create, um, create a membership structure that would achieve several goals at once. We want to distribute the costs more equitably um, and align those fees that we're charging at least somewhat with usage of the services. Um, we, don't want it, we don't want to do that entirely. Um, we also want to take into account size and type of institution in our fee setting and some other things. But we've, we've felt strongly that um, institutions that are using more of our services need to bear somewhat more of the costs. We also felt strongly that we want to retain the consortial nature of our um, relationship with our members. We are not vendors and we don't compete on that um, level for providing of services. Um, we benefit from having a collegial and um, collaborative relationship with our members working together. And Finally, we wanted to create space for growth in our membership, especially among smaller academic libraries. So our new fee setting method then has two parts um, that add up to an annual membership fee for each member. And the first part of that fee is based on, is a flat fee um, that's assigned to a number of membership categories that were created to reflect different sizes or types of institutions. And then the second part of the fee um, is uh, the service modules 
Um, so there's a fee for each service, um, assigned to each service that any given member uses. Just to be clear, we're not contracting here separately for each service that we're providing. Um, we're just using this as a method for determining the appropriate annual fee for membership for each member. So these are those base membership fees based on the categories of membership. And you can see on the left the five categories that we've, we currently are moving to, toward. Um, we still have that founding research or ARL institutions category. Um, we also have a high research activity institutions category, master's colleges and universities, private liberal arts colleges, and community colleges. And you can see in the second column how these map on to the current membership structure. So you can see there that um, everything other than that founding um, tier one category would have fallen under tier two in the old, the old structure. We created these categories um, and loosely based them on the Carnegie basic um, classification categories. Um, and you can see how those map um, in the third column. And then finally, the fee assigned to each category. And our founding institutions are still paying at a significantly higher rate um, than, than others. This base membership fee covers, um, you know, the costs of not just the kind of overhead costs of operating the consortium, but also come with a number of benefits in and of themselves, including the rights to participate in the governance and direction setting for the consortium to either serve on or elect representatives to serve on our governing board to participate in our member board. Um, they also come with the right to participate in our working groups and committees, have access to our members only email lists, webinars, and discounts. They provide access to the digital preservation network without any additional membership fees. That comes with base your base membership. And then, of course, the optional access to our technology hosting services. And that's the second part of the fee setting. This is the, the fee schedule currently for our services. Um, we have DSpace, Furio, Journals, DuraCloud at TDL, which really should be digital preservation services, and our new Texas Data Repository service. And a couple of these services are broken into um, multiple categories, most notably the DSpace hosting, which is broken into um, different categories based on the size of the repository. Nearly all of our repositories are firmly ensconced in the small category. Um, we have a few members who have um, large repositories. And one of the challenges that we faced is that those large repositories are considerably more expensive to, to operate because of the storage costs and the need for larger computers to run them on. Um, and that was sort of the rationale for, for breaking those up. Um, we're also, and this doesn't really apply to anybody on this call, but going forward when, when members add new services um, to their um, membership, um, we will be charging a setup, a one-time setup fee um, to cover the increased uh, work and, and costs that come along with setting up a new service for a member. All right, and I just want to point out that we, we have set fees for the Texas Data Repository service um, for the coming year, um, and those are reflected here on this fee schedule as well. There are two categories, one for the high research activity or doctoral institutions, and uh, one for everybody else. We will maintain our affiliate categories of membership 
um, for the coming, for the foreseeable future. We have um, our regular affiliates, the D Space Fury and OJS hosting um, affiliates, and our preservation affiliate category. We've also added categories for the Texas Data Repository if an institution wants to use. Uh, only that Texas Data Repository service and not have full membership in the cons consortium. So I just want to wrap up here with a reminder about the significant benefits of TDL membership, especially of membership at one of those regular membership levels, which is what's depicted here. Regular membership not only gets an institution access to the hosting services we provide, at a lower rate than affiliates get, but it also makes the institution part of our self-governed community, making sure that our members' voices are heard when we talk about the direction of the consortium and giving access to the many and growing community programs that we coordinate and lead, including training, conference discounts, access to the digital preservation network, members-only webinars, the TDL help desk, et cetera. Affiliate members, while they get access to a pretty high return on investment hosted service and the benefit of the TDL help desk and support, um, they get none of the benefits of full-fledged membership, including governance rights and participation rights in community programs. Okay, this is my last slide, and I'll pause for questions after this slide, so if you have them I, or feedback, we'd love to um, take the opportunity to hear those, and um, you can use the chat window to begin entering those in. Um, but I do want to say that we recognize these changes will do negatively impact some members. Some members' fees are going up, some of them significantly as a result of these changes. And we are um, working closely with those members to make sure that we implement these changes thoughtfully and um, as painlessly as possible. Um, one of the things that we're committing to is that any increase resulting from the change will be phased in over a minimum three-year period. So the change won't hit all at once. Um, we are contracting, or we're revising contracts right now, um, outlining this, this new fee setting method, and those will go out in July um, this coming summer for the fiscal year starting September 1st, um, so that you can um, plan to keep an eye out for those. Um, and I also want to point out finally that overall TDL will not be bringing in as much membership income once these changes go into effect. Um, so these changes are not intended to increase our overall um, revenue or income from membership. Instead, we're using some one-time funds that we've built up over the, the past several years to bridge our operations and invest in growing our membership. Um, over the next several years in order to create that broader, more stable base of funding for the consortium going forward. And, and we've been bringing on new staff in Courtney and in a new uh, communications coordinator that we're working to hire right now to help us do that. So we're excited about the, the possibilities that these changes provide for us and um, look forward to working with you and addressing any of your questions and concerns as we move forward. So I'm going to stop there and I'll just pause for a minute and see if there are any questions. Okay. Well, um, if questions do come up, as you know, you're always welcome to contact me or Laura or um, any of us here at TDL, um, and we'll be happy to talk through any of your, your concerns. But thanks for um, giving me a little time today. Sure, and now I'll hand this over to Courtney Moma to give an update on the TDR Steering Committee. 
Hi, thank you, Laura, um, and thank you, Christy. Um, so I'm just going to talk really quickly about our first TDR steering committee meeting um, that just happened in March with liaisons from um, all of the member institutions who have opted in to usage of Dataverse so far and assigned data liaisons. If you want to be a part of this TDR steering committee and you are not yet, um, then all it takes is basically opting in again to using Dataverse and then um, assigning a liaison that will be part of the steering committee. Right now, we've committed to doing monthly meetings. Our next one is actually next week, and we have quite a big agenda for it on April 26th. Um, and then we're going to have our in-person meeting for the first time at TCDL on May 23rd from 2.45 to 4 p.m. Um, right now, our priorities are putting together a steering committee charter that we've just started a draft on, um, and it'll bit, take a bit of time for us to get through editing that and then sharing it out. We're working on a development roadmap for Dataverse um, specifically, but also training services and resource, resource sharing um, and assessment tools around um, uh, research data specifically. And then we're also trying to assess what methods of communication work best um, to get information about what we're doing out to TDL members and then also openly to the public. Um, I'm going to keep trying to report on the work of the steering committee here for the time being um, in these forums, um, but we'll find other ways to get that information out there so you all know what we're working on at any given time. And then I also have uh, an announcement today. Um, we have at TDL, um, this is part of our digital preservation services, which is the other hat that I wear for TDL. Um, we have a new partnership agreement with Chronopolis. Um, we will be a Chronopolis node at TDL. And I'll tell you a little about what Chronopolis is. It is a digital preservation storage network that started back in 2008 and it spans multiple institutions and geographic regions, which we know is especially important for digital preservation storage. Um, it started at UCSD there in San Diego, um, and another node is at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR, and another at the University of Maryland's Institute for Advanced Computer Studies, or UMEAX, and now will be added to that list, um, along with another new node that's just launching in Germany. Chronopolis does active preservation. That means that they are constantly checking the items. They actually use a system called ACE Audit Tool, um, which some of you may have heard of, but I'll tell you more about that um, when we give a more detailed joint statement with Chronopolis in the coming weeks. And Chronopolis also has, as of 2012, Trusted Digital Repository Certification. So they underwent an audit and um, our Chronopolis node will undergo the same audit sometime in the next um, year or so, as soon as auditors are assigned. So what this partnership does is it allows for a non-commercial, highly distributed dark archive option for DuraCloud. So up until now, if you're using DuraCloud, your options are S3 and Glacier, which are both Amazon services, and of course, those are commercial. Um, DuraCloud offers excellent service, but we wanted to make sure to extend that storage option so that there would be a non-commercial choice there, and that's what Chronopolis will give us. And again, um, as I mentioned before, we're going to follow up with a much more detailed joint statement kind of press release in the next few weeks, and we'll send that out to the member list. And that's all I have for you today, but feel free to ask me any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Courtney and, um, and Christy, for these announcements. I just have a couple of things. I'll keep it quick, but we're very happy to welcome Clark Kim as our new systems administrator here at the TDL. He started on April 5th and has been going through the onboarding and learning process. So we're very excited to have him join us. And just a reminder that the TCDL will be May 23rd through the 25th. Um, registration is still open, of course, and the uh, more time-sensitive thing would be if you haven't yet booked your hotels, 
there's a special rate for TCDL attendees through April 24th. So you can find more information on the website. And there will be an, a special Hydra workshop, um, an open source solution to build digital repositories. We have Mark Busey from the Digital Curation Experts coming to give that workshop on Tuesday. So if you're planning to attend, there is one option, as well as a number of other workshops. So feel free to sign up for those on Tuesday. Um, there's also Dataverse and the Texas Data Repository, a Weaver framework, um, metadata management tools, and also a Vireo 4 update. So be sure to check those out. And you can register for those. It's free with your registration to TCDL. We just ask that you register in advance because seating is limited. But lots of exciting stuff for the TCDL. Also, there's an upcoming Humanities Intensive Learning and Teaching Institute here at the UT Austin Libraries. That'll be June 5th through 8th. And there's registration and more information online, but if you or colleagues may be interested, um, it's a pretty exciting symposium. So yeah, just wanted to make everyone aware of that. Also, just something to put on your calendars. Um, save the date for a special Fedora camp that will be held here in Austin in October of this year, October 16th through the 18th, here at the Perry Castaneda Libraries. And we'll have more information coming soon, but just something to keep an eye out for. And also a reminder about the TDL Community Google Group. Um, a lot of times we learn things that are going on from the libraries through various channels or just word, word of mouth. But if you have announcements, upcoming events, or you know, job postings, or even if you just want to learn more about a certain software tool or have a question, the TDL Community Google Group is there. So feel free to post in that, and that does go out to all of our members. It's um, similar to the TDL Announce email list, but just a more user-friendly version of that. So yeah, I hope you'll take advantage of that. And really briefly, uh, where we'll be directly following this, Christy Park will be headed over to Texas Library Association Conference in San Antonio. And also Nicholas Woodward will be at DPLA Fest this week, um, which we're excited about presenting there. And of course, we will all be at the TCDL in May. So we hope to see you all there as well. And then the next TDL forum, of course, will be May 17th. And we still have a couple of minutes if anybody has any questions or, or comments. While Lauren's typing, um, I just want to add a, an extra um, congratulations to Courtney and to Ryan as well, who's not here with us today, but um, on their work um, with Chronopolis and UC San Diego and getting that partnership put together. We're really excited about the possibilities that it provides for our members for another preservation storage option and also for the possibilities it provides for us in Texas to um, to work with um, another trusted group in digital preservation and, and see what um, work we can do together. Lauren asked about a link to this presentation. Um, we will be providing that. It, the presentation itself will be in the Texas Digital Library DSpace repository. Um, and a recording of the presentation will be on there and on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're also working on getting this information up on the website in the membership section of the website and that'll happen soon and we'll be sending out a, a formal announcement as well so you'll have multiple opportunities to review it 
Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Okay, well, as always, if you do think of any other questions, feel free to contact any of us. So I guess we'll wrap it up now. We're approaching the end of the hour, but thank you all so much for attending today and hope you have a great rest of the week. Bye.